Hey, uh, thanks everyone for coming here after a nightclub that maybe ends 4 a.m. and now it's 9 a.m. Um, but yeah, uh, today we're going to discuss open science in Asia and Korea, and we have panelists from from different places, different countries. So, Chan Fong, who is online, is a faculty member at School of Psychology at Nanjing Normal University in China. His work, he works on cognitive modeling, self-cognition, and meta-science. But he also initiated the Chinese Open Science Network, a grass network aims to promote open science using both Chinese and English. And he also served as a member of executive committee of uh, Society of, for the Improvement of Psychological Science. And I have Jinja Amai Wright, who is currently a professor in the Department of Psychology at National Changong University in Taiwan. He got his PhD from Brown University in 2006 and then did his postdoc at Princeton till 2008. His research focused on neuroimaging methods, especially fMRI, to investigate topics in face object recognition and social neuroscience. He was also involved in founding the servicing of the NCKU MRI Center and recent year has been keenly promoting open science, open neuroscience in psychology and uh, in southern Taiwan. And I also have uh, Hiromasa, who got his PhD from University of Tokyo, so he's from Japan, and he studies uh, visual motion perception. And during three years of postdoc training at Stanford, he initiated a series of projects using diffusion MRI and tractography to study human visual system. And from 2015 to 2021, he continued his research uh, as a researcher and at uh, NICT CINET in yeah, Osaka. CINET. Yeah. CINET. Oh, no, sorry, CINET. CINET, yes. And oh. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, Hiromasa became a full professor at the National Institute of Physiology, Physiological Science in Osaka, and he was awarded Early Career Investigator Award by the OH OHBM in 2022, and now is a council member as well, and he is also participating in open science. And then I finally, last but not least, I have Wong Muk from here, from Korea, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and Brain Science at Dartmouth between 2010 to 2016. And since, since 2016, she has been an associate professor of biomedical engineering at Song, Song Kyung Kwan University, SKKU University in South Korea. And her research interests focused on how the brain represents and processes perceptual and cognitive information ranging from low-level sensory features to high-level context and prediction. She has also been leading a 17 naturalist perception, action, and cognition data set project, NetPack. So that's involved in open data, I think. So today we have, uh, I, I'm Ruchi. I'm a postdoc in Toronto and also part of the OpenSense SIG. So we're interested in discussing open science and maybe promoting it in Asia. And this is Xiang Zhen uh, from China, who is also part of Open Sensing, and we will be moderating the session. So I'm going to start with questions, and the panelists will be answering them. And then we will have, feel free to just come up if you have any questions. But towards the end of the session, we, we are expecting to have like a Q&A session uh, for more discussion. So the idea of this session is that I think there are a lot of specific challenges that we're facing in Asia when we're trying to promote open science. And I wonder if like communicating between the, the Western community that has already been doing it for the past maybe two decades could help us here facing these specific challenges. So to start, uh, could you share like what successes you had in open science in when you're trying to promote it in your country? So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I I was uh, involved in uh, promoting open science because 
uh, I have a colleague who's also in Taiwan was uh, from psychological science aspect, Chen Xiaoqing. Uh, <clears throat> we kind of uh, work together and also several others trying to push or promote. So we try to at least uh, do once a year or twice a year uh, all kinds of activities that are uh, trying to keep us, you know, uh, active in, in this uh, aspect. I'm from neuroscience or neuroimaging side. So from my uh, uh, work, so what I can, what I did before was to uh, at least try to uh, download the open data and um, analyze the data with students, class takers of neuroimaging. And then we have done so far five uh, data sets. And also uh, in when we publish our papers, we also upload it to Open Neuro. So we have now three data sets online. And well, none of them was uh, trying to, in the, uh, was in the scientific data, but we're trying to uh, currently work on it now. And others, like uh, in the summer, uh, like last summer, this summer, we're still working on it, uh, try to have uh, online workshops, uh, introducing methods or, yeah, just type, like like Pollock type of sharing that we have students uh, sharing what they've done and methodologies and et cetera. Uh, it's all free, open to anyone, and it's recorded so people can watch it later. And the code data set, um, and because it's uh, there, so we just repeat what we have done, things like that. <clears throat> so this is what I've done. Uh, well, I think when back, I went back to Japan from the United States in 2015, it's just already maybe about nine years before then. At that time, I think sharing human data was more difficult because that's kind of just in general fear, like how much just privacy violation or maybe ILB people don't know what's the right procedure to approve it because it's just not well standardized. So that moment was more difficult. There's just more conversation, maybe think about a rule. Then a couple of the years before, maybe a sign of joint team belongs to some government or working group make a kind of new uh, update is some human study ethics guideline. Then in there, I think the statement about maybe how you just get the informed consent uh, for just uh, sharing the data, quite a human, how you can do it, then this is what shouldn't do it. Then it's a very complicated document. I think it just become more standardized nowadays. Then I think it's becoming more and more possible uh, to use some, maybe some relatively uh, confirmed, maybe protocol for just getting IRB approval, then standardization of the anonymization. It's just getting, maybe it's just getting started nowadays. Then I think nowadays, well, my own laboratory doesn't get huge data, it's just a small laboratory. Maybe it's just project data, some of them are kind of released after some anonymization. I'm not sure it's just broadly useful, but you can just check some of them. And we have some the code in the GitHub as well. Uh, for just replicating some analysis and just a uh, figure. But in general, Japan, maybe there's kind of some, maybe data collection, maybe some uh, public databases kind of starting to get be rising more. Because maybe nine years ago, it's very difficult to do it. But sometimes, nowadays, maybe especially maybe clinical neuroimage, I make some consortium, then they're just collecting some data, they're just trying to make it kind of more or less accessible. So I think that things are kind of started to get changing. All right. Um, so uh, let's see. I uh, joined um, at the um, Institute for um, Basic Science and uh, CNIR Center um, for Neuroimaging, uh, sorry, Neuroscience uh, Imaging Research. So uh, at our center, I'm in Korea. So at the center, we had uh, we have 3T and 7T scanner, and at the time, a 7T scanner was slightly underutilized. So there was a discussion at our center about like what we can do. Um, so something that has an impact and, and contribute to the field. And as uh, many of you know, uh, that uh, we have some large data set um, uh, in our um, field, like um, the heavily used um, HCP and UK Biobank. But then um, we know that there aren't many um, data sets from other countries, right? So this has been repeatedly um, pointed out uh, by our community. And uh, we thought that uh, maybe this kind of effort um, can enhanced diversity um, for this regard. So as Ruchi introduced, um, I'm involved in this um, collecting large scale 70 data set uh, called um, 70 NetPack, what we call naturalistic perception, action and cognition. 
So our philosophy is a little different from um, HCCP and UK Biobank. Uh, they're, um, they're collecting a lot of data from a lot of people. So uh, we are collecting a lot of data from a small number of subjects, so repeatedly, but not the, uh, the same task, but um, using a, a variety of tasks. So that's the idea. And uh, um, I think, I mean, as you also know, that establishing this large scale data set uh, requires a lot of resources. So we have only recently begun this process. So um, yeah, we are hoping to build this, build this data set and then um, we will make it publicly available uh, once uh, we um, complete the data collection. Thank you. Uh, Champong, uh, would you like to share some of your open sense experience in China? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So uh, I think my perspective is a bit more grassroots or from the perspective of uh, early career research because I started to get involved in open science from 2016 uh, during, during my PhD. I think at that time, we uh, because I was trained in psychology and around that time, we have a replication crisis. And so after that, a lot of uh, policy policies start to change, including general policy and uh, method we are using. So I started to uh, make small interest group uh, and discuss how, how should we uh, face the challenges for the policy changes. Uh, then it becomes to the Chinese Open Science Network, a grassroots network, and it is survived after the pandemic. And now we have uh, like 31,000 su subscribers on our WeChat uh, account. And also to lower the language barrier because most of the like the material learning materials training materials and uh, courses or discussions occurred in english so uh, with colleagues i published a few papers written in chinese so that we can bring the ideas to early career researchers maybe undergrads or math students training in chinese um, they can already learn something about new open science uh, just using chinese I think that's uh, something we have done. Uh, so for the Chinese Open Science Network, we organize us a lot of uh, online events, uh, including online talks. So uh, we invite speakers, share the experience uh, on open science. <laughs> uh, actually, all of you can be a speaker in the future. Uh, we've already uh, invited uh, Russell Podrick and uh, like Michael Frank. Uh, the other is open tutorial. We invite like postdoc and the senior PhD students to share their experience in how to uh, how to analyze data or how to uh, do something in, in their research. And we also have a gel club. Like uh, we organize almost like every two weeks. We discuss literature related to reproduce re reproducibility and uh, open science. And yeah, we we have a. Uh, group of uh, early career researchers. We organize online events. We also have a, a yearly hackathon. So we try to bring the idea of hackathon, doing things together uh, to, to, to China, because I, I think it's a new idea. It's a new uh, way of organizing conference. So uh, that's what, what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. So it seems like we you're all different, different. You're all doing different things, promoting open science in your own country, and that's the nice part. And now we're going into um, the tough part. So, how do researchers in your local community think of open science? And that might be related to questions like, do you face any challenges promoting open science in your country, and maybe also some resistant points. Uh. The reason I mentioned uh, the co another colleague is because we pretty often uh, during our internal meetings encourage each other. Uh, we're like we're like preachers <laughs> that you have to have the mindset that if even nobody or very few people are you know like answering the call, we still do it. And in the spirit of this is uh, good for the long term, um, many established. Uh, Faculties, um, they they have many various kind of concerns. I also heard some more uh, during this uh, OHPN. But other than that, we're still working on it. And so this is something that um, you know, like kind of you're working along. They kind of 
feeling is always present. Yeah, okay, I'll say it first. Mm, well, maybe it's not just open science specific. I sometimes found just talking with maybe my colleague or student in Japan, maybe talking about new idea, maybe bridging different community, sometimes there's kind of hesitation. It's just a very cultural. <laughs> I think people have some kind of mental barrier to enjoy this type of new activities and join the conversation. They're just feeling very shy. Then it's just purely culture, nothing just about maybe science or policy. Then I think it's just a kind of people are a little conservative in order to make a kind of social network, maybe join the open science activity, hackathon, and all other meetings. So I don't know what to do because it's kind of very general issues. <laughs> People are just so shy. Maybe we can just slowly broaching pitch with each other. But I think maybe I think it's important to keep in mind, that especially people in the East Asia, they usually don't self-promote. Then they usually don't self-nominate. So when you are just making some maybe committee organization, starting new activity, maybe it's better to be conscious about this aspect. Well, let's just start an open science committee or maybe symposium, maybe circus organization. Then you can just pay attention to people who want to self-nominate. I want to do it. Nothing is wrong about it. But usually people in our culture group, maybe I'm just heavily influenced by US, I'm typical, but they don't raise a hand. <laughs> they're kind of more passive. They, it doesn't mean they are not interested. So. Well, I mean, what, what I'm thinking is also, it resonates very well with uh, what uh, Hiromasa already talked about. So I don't see a lot of like active resistance to open science. The main issue is more like um, lack of interest, low interest. So it's hard to um, get people's attention and initiate it, I think. I mean, actually, um, the, um, some projects, um, government-funded projects already require um, data sharing or data uploads into public um, repositories. So um, yeah, there is th that effort. And also, we know many journals already require data sharing, code sharing uh, upon publication, and we are no exception to that. Um, but um, what I don't see is that uh, a lot of researcher-initiated open science activities uh, in Korea. So um, I don't know where to start. I mean, it's, this is probably deeply uh, related to what Hiromasa um, already mentioned. So um, the grassroots network, um, open, si open science network uh, that he talked about, maybe that may be a good example. Um, so little by little, probably we could, uh, you know, change our culture to like more open to um, that kind of small group discussions and uh, um, those grassroots activities, I think. So also it'd be great if we could learn from other countries where um, open science uh, has already been well established uh, about the strategy, how to actually promote uh, more spontaneous uh, open science practices. Champong? Uh, Uh, so uh, actually, <laughs> we have a survey about uh, like uh, the researchers in in the field recently. So we have like uh, uh, asked them like three questions: What is your attitude towards, for example, open access, open data, open script? And then uh, we was asked their intention to implement some of these open science practices. And then we was asked what they had actually done, uh, like whether or not they have implemented some uh, open science practices. So <laughs> our result is that most of them have a very positive t attitude towards these open science practices. But then when it comes to intention, then fewer people like intended to, or they have the motivation to implement some of those open science practices in the near future. And then even fewer people actually implemented some open science practices. So I think that the problem might be in the, or well, large part of the problem might lie in the incentive system. Uh, because uh, yeah, as East Asia culture, we have like a strong collectivism. So some, some, something from the central or from the top usually have a stronger influence. If you deviate from this norm set by the top, then you might, at least mentally, you, you, you feel that you have a great cost. So I think that if the incentive system is still there, uh, we just uh, uh, like reward for publication instead of uh, instead of sharing your data, then fewer people will spend time to 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 work less their data and share their, their data, and they and that's motivated to do so. So I think that that might be a big issue. Mm. 
Thank you for sharing. So it looks like in different, even just within Asia, different countries are facing different challenges, different situations. Sometimes it's you do have people that are interested, that are shy, but also you have the community that are not really interested in it. Um, so, I, so I wonder if you could be more specific about the challenges. Like, how do students view it, and or your colleague researchers, and what about also the policymakers and how do they have different attitudes in your countries as well regarding open science? Okay. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, 2016, uh, there are also like several scandals, academic like fraud, and uh, we also make uh, some policy changes uh, afterwards, like newly uh, recruited uh, faculties. Uh, if they want to apply for grants, they have to attend six hours of ethical training and all the incoming students, grad students, uh, RAs are, have to do that. So it's like a you know formal thing and all the uh, dissertation uh, thesis now have to be go to um, authenticate, um, authenticated. Uh, yeah, those kind of uh, checking for parasitic uh, things first. Those are just, you know, some uh, changes that is mandated to, and it's been for years. But uh, um, yeah, I've also I resonate with many of the uh, colleagues. Say. I heard one or two like from t uh, recent uh, t these uh, past few days. Uh, I remember one faculty from uh, my country, from Taiwan, also commented like if part of their data was from uh, was from patients and in uh, anonymous sized those. Uh, patient data, although I said it should be, you know, like NII data should be already um, anonymized and also uh, all, all this in personal information should be already omitted in the CSVs. But the, they say uh, the, government, the the institute has some, uh, you know, things that just like prohibit them from just making any effort to uh, make it uh, public available. So that's something that I heard. and. Uh, also, something that I heard from established scholars, um, they're still in the idea that they they um, they think that they, they share their data. The code is something like, oh, this is the secret of my lab. This is how I spend so much time. And then, if I make it public, um, you know, people might steal my code, might steal my idea, and those mindset are still present. Okay, I'll just mention these two. Well. Talking about policy, I don't think it's very different from other countries because maybe it's kind of a slow process, but maybe from next year, I think one of the major funding agencies, a couple of the major funding agencies who are asking maybe grant submitter to just make some maybe data management plan. It's not very different from other country in terms of policy, but I think one of the potential policy side is maybe privacy law is relatively strong in Japan. I think it's as established as the European, then, especially regarding clinical data. There's always kind of discussion about what level of the open data is kind of good. Maybe especially just clinical record. I think sometimes just sharing is kind of kind of dangerous or prohibited. Some lawyers just make conservative just a recommendation of the IOB sometimes. Um, I, I remember maybe Tonya White just write a paper to, to talking about maybe some gradation with the different levels of open data access. Maybe some data is just well suited for free open just data. Then so someone maybe some restriction you need some paperwork about data usage, but just still accessible. Or maybe somewhere, maybe some information is more they identify. There's some gradation of that data. Then I think it's very important for maybe talking with people, we should appreciate this kind of gradation because depending on the situation, nature of the data set, maybe we should just accept which just level of the openness is just more ideal. I think that's a very important part for talking about these people. Well, I mean, policy-wise, I mean, Korea, I, I don't think uh, there's a much of a difference. Uh, as I already mentioned, um, the government actually uh, established uh, the na national um, data repository. And then um, for some subjects, they already require for us to actually put the data into it. Um, so, uh, but then, uh, you know, it's more like um, how whether the people uh, actually actively do it, like, um, uh, you know, at their will. So uh, that is the, uh, the more of the question, I think. And it would take more time uh, to change people's uh, view about uh, this, I think. 
But I have some faith in Korea because <laughs> we are known for I mean, dynamic Korea. So we are very good at accepting new ideas, I think. So um, in that regard. But then one more thing that I'd like to point out is that so um, not all open data are uh, very well used. So some uh, data sets are heavily used, like HCP and UK Biobank. Almost we are very biased toward uh, these data sets. But um, other data set, many other data sets seem to uh, remain underutilized, actually. So um, I'm wondering what would be a good way to um, improve the general use of open data resources Right. So that could um, probably motivate people more to share the, their data and uh, code. Um, John Pong, would you like to share? Yeah, so uh, uh, because I don't really have a, a lot of chance to get, 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 in, or, or get in touch with decision makers. So my, my feeling is uh, that similar to the other scholars, the, the central government also have like a regulation for open data for for the, for, for the basic research. Uh, the problem is that uh, there are few people actually do that because uh, lack of incentives. Uh, so I, I strongly agree with that. We need to train students or researchers to uh, uh, like use the data, use the available data. So actually, in my uh, in a recent practical guide I wrote, I written with uh, other researchers from developing countries. Uh, we have like four levels. The first level is to uh, using open resources available after open science movement to help you to survive in academia. So you need to learn how to use all these kind of uh, resources there to know what the cost of your, of your, of your research. Yeah, another point is that I think uh, a lot of uh, different let's say, uh, uh, interested parties involved in open science. A lot of only like researchers like us, but also we have uh, librarians. They are actually uh, quite strong uh, in pushing the concept of open access. We also have uh, publishers who uh, may be uh, actively involved, try to influence the policy in different country. For example, I when I attend uh, open science related conference uh, at different level. I always um, uh, noticed that some like representative from publishers are there. So they, they are also actively engaged in, in this kind of discussion. And we also have uh, like senior researchers who were already like, trained in the old way. Uh, I think maybe may, many of them just don't, don't want change. So <laughs> our strategy actually is uh, a grassroots that works, so we try to uh, educate and train the next generation researchers instead of trying to persuade senior researchers. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have someone from the room. Wait. Yeah, I just have a quick uh, thought to share because uh, speakers were talking about differences in policies within each country or lack of incentives to motiv motivate people. But just thinking that uh, because, for example, people, uh, data sets like HCP or EcoBiobank, ABCD, have been shared out there for people all over the world to use, wouldn't it be actually beneficial for people in Asia to use those data sets um, as a contrast, as a validation data set, or whatever, to use it first and then benefit from it? Isn't that sort of like an incentive to motivate them to get to know the good side of open science and naturally um, cultivate some motivation, intrinsic interest in sharing their own data at some point. Just a quick thought. Mm -hmm. Steph, would you want to chime in? Building actually on that question, because I wanted to ask the same question. But um, building on that question, do you, because you were also saying that you are already using those data sets, do you see Sometimes you talk about representation in academia, in data sets as well, like how diversity is missing, like you were saying as well. Do you see the differences between those data sets that are collected in the West and the data set that you are producing? Or is that something that is more of a thought process and, and a thought uh, problem rather than a reality? Do you want to respond? Well, I mean, uh, even in Korea, some researchers, I mean, many researchers, actually, they started using uh, the HCP and UK Biobank. It's very popular, uh, right? But then um, 
so the one of the things that uh, I realized in, in at OHBM, there are so many presentations uh, using these data sets, right? Almost dominant. And then uh, if we rely on a couple, like small number, I mean, uh, it's a big data set, but small number of specific data sets, I mean, that could really bias the whole field, I think. So that's one other thing. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to actively, um, I mean, the comprehensively compare uh, our data set with the UK Biobank or uh, the HCP. But that's uh, uh, the time it, will tell, time it will tell later. I mean, if we um, complete our data set uh, collection and then, uh, you know, a lot of people can use it, then uh, I think the researcher, uh, also, we can discover whether there is actually a difference or a significant difference in that regard, I think. But it takes time, so. Yeah, we have another question. Yeah, I'm uh, Song Lee from UNC Chapel Hill, and I just have a, one opinion about the data. Why uh, the some of the small small data set cannot be utilized? Because as a person trying to find some data to utilize, sometimes this accessibility is really different. And the one that mostly popularly used, they mostly put some effort on the interface, so they usually can access the data set with a one line of the code, like using the Python module and put some name and that download into the, like a pipeline that's a project folder. So I think putting some effort on that interface, like developing those interface or integrating some common, like a data analysis package or library might be also a good way to uh, make use of like a more uh, increasing the frequency of usage of that uh, package. It's just my personal opinion. Uh, I'm not sure I'm just going to answer your question, but I kind of thinking about kind of two perspectives. So especially if we are going to share the data at the laboratory level, smaller level, I think there are kind of two barriers. I think that one barrier is kind of documentation. Uh, because data sets like HCP or UK, Biobank, they are just generated by large groups. They are just well-funded. They are just dedicated people for talking about maybe folder structure, maybe good documentation, what type of pipeline just coming up together with. It's just, just much way for because they can do it because they have people. But let's imagine you are just a PR, just one postdoc and one student. Even though we have a good intention, I think doing the same level of documentation is just very difficult. Maybe I think it's a good way to think about the idea. Maybe some recommended way to make kind of documentation in order to make it accessible to others, because otherwise I think we do too much effort for both sides. And other perspective is, well, Currently, I think open science activity is heavily related by, well, heavy code writer. People are really good at writing the code. But I sometimes find that some documentation, maybe some open science related code, they kind of have lots of assumed knowledge at the level of kind of documentation because our lab is just trying to just convert everything bit format, just seeking a couple converter. It's actually not super easy for us <laughs> because they're just always kind of assume knowledge of folder structure, maybe coding just structure, maybe some installation with this because, of course, because I think people are good at it. People who are reading are good at it. People know about it. So they're kind of assume knowledge. Maybe it's kind of beneficial for guiding small laboratory, maybe asking people who have less code proficiency to just check in some of these kind of documentation, maybe how to convert Dynecom to beats or how to do it, how to do it, and in order to make it kind of documentation more clear and clearer. So in, in that sense, maybe it's more important for inviting people who have kind of less code proficiency <laughs> to get into discussion because they don't understand. If they don't understand, I think that's actually a problem. So in order to make it more useful. So. I would like to maybe follow up on that. So for example, in, in BrainHack, there, there are a lot of projects like this, BITS, uh, Nightpipe, they, they're looking for students or maybe uh, people that don't know the knowledge that well to join their project and maybe help uh, improve their documentation. But I wonder, because you mentioned that it might be better to invite them and then people here are in generally sh shy. And so are they have, they hesitate in part actively participating. So how do you think we can solve, because it's like we want you, but we don't know where you are. And there are people like on the side secretly hoping that they see me and invite me. But <laughs> how, how do we, like, what do you think is a good way 
for the international community. Well, this also follows up, follow up with our next question, and I'll get back to the the question in the room soon. That how do you think the international community could help regarding these challenges? Yeah. So before we move to yes next question, I, I just want to briefly respond to the question. Uh, yes. About the barriers of using uh, big big data. So, actually, we invited Corey um, Horing, uh, so uh, the first author who published uh, a huge hike's guide to working with large open source data, neural image data sets, to open science uh, Chinese open science network. So, I, I think at that time we asked him a question about what if you do not have uh, like um, like super computer, what what just a few cluster of computer? How how do you Deal with this if you don't have hardware. So basically, there's uh, the answer is no. You, you you cannot reuse this data. I I personally also uh, encounter barrier when accessing this uh, large scale neural image data set. So now I think NIH they uh, require some like approval from your institute. If your institute in the list of NIH, then you can access to those data uh, after. Uh, approval from admin of your institute. The problem is not all the country, not all the institute in developing countries are on the list of NIH. So that's the problem. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's difficult for like a uh, researcher, uh, early career researchers, like get approval, like uh, to to uh, uh, go through what the process for uh, applying for uh, for the institute being leased. Uh, by NIH. So I think there's also barriers. Um, so two barriers about uh, using this data. And also the documentation, I, I, I fully agree. So because most of open data are not so well documented, it's really hard to use them. But as I mentioned, I, I really want to have a new series uh, in our open science network, Chinese open science network, just talking about how to reuse open data. Because I think that's that would be motivate our early career researchers to like uh, to see the value of open science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, would you like to say something first? Because well, uh, part of my question was asked by him. What as uh, as I, I asked by him as in how um, making you know better interfaces easier to. Uh, just easily easily accessible um, like front end might benefit uh, more uses of uh, data sets from Asia um, and something else that also I had in mind was um, the main the main the main reason why HCP and like UK Biobank are so attractive is because of the sheer like the sheer end the sheer the size of the end right like it's a large number so you can do a lot of interesting um, Statistical analysis and machine learning, um, train machine learning models on it, which is which uh, makes ma makes the data sets so uh, um, hot in OHPM right now. Um, why? But I, I I've heard uh, I think China I've heard China has a, like a, China is trying to make a, like make similar data sets. Like uh, I heard there's like a Chinese color nest cohort things like that. But um, um, I don't know if there is uh, any similar data. Like uh, Dr. Shim mentioned that we have a national repository, but are, is there like an effort to, uh, you know, kind of bundle all that data together into a single data set that's um, marketable? <laughs> I don't think it's not there yet. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are just only uh, begun this process. So maybe there may be m many trial and errors uh, in, on the, in the process, I think. Um, the couple of things that uh, that just came to my mind um, as I just listening to uh, your question uh, was uh, right. So UK Biobank and HCP uh, they are so attractive in many uh, regards. I mean it's a huge data set, um, but not just that they are from uh, these couple of countries. It's more like they they um, their tasks are set. <laughs> so we are very um, uh, you know shaped by these tasks, but there are there could be like many different tasks. Right, so HACP has a um, some set of uh, right um, the structured tasks, and they have also movie watching. But then uh, the tasks could be uh, much more diverse than that. 
but then we are very limited by this. And then whenever we uh, talk about cognitive processes and visual, uh, uh, the perceptual processes or affective processes, we are actually uh, limited by kinds of tasks in that data set. I think that's uh, one of the um, things that uh, we have to keep in mind. I mean, they are not, not covering the whole uh, you know, cognitive processes that we are interested. So uh, that's one thing. But then as, as you mentioned, also the previous uh, person who asked the question, um, there is a reason why the small data sets are underutilized, right? It's, it's um, much more difficult to use, right? So uh, we need to put more effort to, into uh, make it more standardized procedure, I think. So he already mentioned about BZ format. Um, initially, it's work <laughs> on a uh, researcher side. But then um, I think BZ format, at the, that, those kinds of practices actually change our field. Right, so make the data sharing um, much easier across the people. But then again, it takes it takes time. I mean, to spread this um, standardized procedures and steps uh, to all other, you know, you know, many many different steps of research. I mean, it takes time. So we are in the middle of that process. So that's why we are having all these issues. I think. Mm -hmm. And also for like the UK Biobank or HCP, I think some of them are also involved in our. O OSIG or they're here at OHBM and it takes a lot of people and resources to maintain and they are even sometimes struggling with it. Uh, so needless to say with smaller groups and smaller data set and places that doesn't have that many resources. So that kind of comes back to the question like for your thoughts about the next step pushing or promoting open science in your country how do you think the international community could help regarding that? Specifically, I'm thinking about OSIC. Like, how could we help regarding that? Or even to the larger community that are interested in open science now? Uh, Ruji has <clears throat> raised this question. We had a discussion uh, yesterday as well. Uh, I guess we, we always like to, uh, yeah, just by grassroots or, you know, like we're working our own. Uh, I guess it's a bit by bit uh, manner. Like you, we started by doing something. Whenever we start doing something, we just CC you, <laughs> and then you will be notified. And then um, when we are in the whenever like drafting a grant proposal, or et cetera, and we, we might be just be able to know. Oh, this there's a deadline, and then we can think about how to put your um, you know seek uh, badge or you know name or knowledge or just in the uh, drafting phase, we, we can uh, try to think if um, OHPN or C can, can help. And any kind of uh, support from financial to uh, personnel or others could be of help. I guess we will start by this kind of um, <clears throat> activities, like bit by bit. Then we have more collaboration uh, experiences, and then we can think about something uh, bigger and bigger. I guess we'll start by by this manner. Well, maybe it's kind of important to share the feeling that there are just two different ways of doing some good science. But one, one way is, of course, you can already existing resources, like maybe HTTP, UK, Bank, ABCD, I, I, I don't know, you can just use it. Then you are just project running fast, and people use other data, people can easily replicate, then you can just make some unique contribution, just you can do it. And sometimes, asking maybe graduate students stuff from there because they're just getting first, running a code quickly. Then maybe some findings can be kind of preserving some reproducibility to some degree. But I think it's also important to aware that maybe especially for early career scientists, they kind of benefit to acquire their own data. Because first, they can be aware about the process about how data is acquired, how just MR work, MEG works, how data can be standardized, how it's hard to acquire that data. Well, what is kind of a unique research question you can just put into when you acquire data, how just data can be helpful. Because if we are just downloading the data from outside, then we are kind of too much dependent. I think it's important to just take up value, like maybe acquisition the new data, it's quite important. Then maybe that's just one more say, we could just address some research question. We couldn't just simply address by just downloading some HP and UK bank. I think in the end, we are just scientists. Then I think scientific question matter. Then that just motivates people. Then it's very important to emphasize that's just value in both way. Then maybe this would persuade people to get the benefit of downloading data, but they will also share the data, acquire new data. Mm. 
Well, um, yeah, I already mentioned about this point many times, but um, it's more about like changing your uh, your thinking um, in any text time. So, for example, throughout your graduate training, if you uh, realize that oh, it's actually a good thing to share my data and good thing to uh, you know share my code uh, with other people, and those small experiences actually amount to you know your uh, you know view or your attitude toward open science, I think. Um, but then, as I said, we are beginning this process, so like we, maybe like we need a little more patience in this uh, process. I think, then um, you know, as I already mentioned, um, uh, you know, by him, um, you know, there's a lot of preaching too, <laughs> that too, and it could be um, the local uh, community scale preaching or international level preaching, right? So in both ways. Yes, uh, Chan Peng, would you like to chime in on this? Yeah. So for me, uh, I think uh, the next step uh, for promoting open science in within our community is that we need like um, uh, having disciplinary open science conference because we already have like uh, people from this different field, even from different sectors, show their interest in open science. So we need to talk about with each other and how to do this together. I think this is uh, maybe it's, it will uh, accelerate this process a bit. Uh, for international community, I think then uh, it's very important to support the early career researchers. Uh, so, for example, if we have like students training in abroad in US, in Europe, or in somewhere, you, and uh, it would be great to train this early career researchers with the open science practice and also support them to engage in open science uh, promotion and everything. So because only by doing so, we can like uh, change the mind of our next generation researchers. And then we can slowly change the, the, the research culture. Yeah, I, I would. I also want to briefly respond to a previous question about whether there's a difference between Western and Eastern uh, uh, I think in, in the Western media, at least Tao Yakoni previously emphasized the personal responsibility for uh, changing the research culture. Uh, there are also other researchers uh, emphasize that uh, we as researchers need to take the responsibility to change. So I think this is less emphasized in our community. Uh, at least what I learned from our training is that you need to uh, maybe uh, obey the rule, obey the normal, uh, follow the follow your advisors, your your, your supervisors. Uh, instead of take your responsibility as a researcher to change the research culture, so I think in at least in in our community we need to emphasize this more. Yeah, thank mm, you. Thank you. So it it sounds like there are uh, a lot of efforts that need to be done locally and and also internationally. And we also need time to more patience to see see the change coming. And there are a lot of cultural aspect to this as well. Um, we have a question in the room. Yeah, the point about culture is really excellent. Like I moved from Korea to Germany like 10 years ago, and it took me a while to, for me to realize that I can actually like talk to PIs, you know, <laughs> what I might think. Yeah, but so like, I'm really uh, glad that I'm like at this point, uh, like very comfortable, like uh, sharing my ideas and opinions. I, I actually wanted to like, uh, regarding your question earlier, like what can OSC do for uh, Asian countries? Mm -hmm. I want to ask the question like from the other side. So I really appreciate you being here, for instance. So I, I really wonder like, what about the rest of uh, Korean uh, brain mapping society? So uh, I, I actually, was very looking forward to this particular session. So like I heard OHBM was gonna be hosted in Korea and then I knew that um, it is my first time. Uh, it has a reputation for a community that promotes open science a lot. So I, I would have expected actually like a little more interest in this session, especially. Yeah. Right, so um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm emphasizing this point too many times like, uh, um, we are in the process. So, I mean, so for example, uh, the big data set, uh, you know, so um, the one that I mentioned, so we are still collecting the data. I mean, once it's, um, you know, done, then um, I think it can be really shared by uh, the people there. 
And then, uh, you know, once uh, it's viewed from the Korean um, community that this is actually a good practice and good thing to do, then um, I think I hope that uh, it will promote um, more of these efforts in the future. So, and uh, um, also uh, I want to mention that the reason that we can do uh, at our center is that actually we have resources. Uh, as I told you, um, government-funded project. I mean, uh, Institute for Basic Science. That I mean, that actually uh, support all the infrastructure and uh, resources. That's why, and I think that's one of the missions. I mean, I think we, sh we uh, the institute like us, should do this. So that's why we started this. Hmm. Yes. Uh, thank you for all good uh, lectures and the, the opening uh, OHBM 2024. Uh, I'm an uh, author languagist uh, and scientist and the Sejong Medical Association president. I'm interested about uh, the brain research and uh, MRI research. Uh, about uh, 20 or uh, 13 years ago, Dr. Zhu uh, the made the 17 uh, MRI systems. At that time, uh, we are best. Uh, but uh, this research is uh, slightly start. Uh, main problem is the uh, world infection, the uh, virus and COVID-19. Uh, but still yet, uh, remain the uh, uh, research team uh, continues uh, our work. The main work of the need a uh, creative idea and vast investment, uh, especially the government uh, supporting. Uh, I think that uh, temporarily uh, we became the pussy such as the answers. Uh, but uh, I'm very proud uh, our researchers and the scientists. Uh, I want to encourage uh, creative with worker. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I also have another question that I have for the for the panelists today, which is we have a brain hack before OHBM. And this is something that uh, people will also participate like around, there are a lot of events like this. And so this year, we originally were hoping that we have more Asian attendees. And we did a survey. We have two that's not from Europe or North America. And we don't know why. So. I'm wondering, do you have any insight in like, how do people see brain hack? Do people know what brain hack is? What is the main uh, challenges or obstacles that people don't show up or are not interested in this or they're not aware of this or should we be promoting it much? Like, what are your thoughts on this? Because Because there's a lot of, like a conversation that happens during brain hack, like documentation, they could participate, they could collaborate, but we didn't see a lot of attendees or interests from the Asian community. Uh, <clears throat> I'll point on two things. Um, I've sent one of my uh, students before to uh, the brain hack 2017, and she uh, really uh, enjoyed it and shared a lot afterwards. And she already finished her PhD uh, uh, in uh, Belgium, yeah, uh, recently. But the point is that uh, for teachers uh, who are always busy, and yeah, we only can send our students and to attend. And if, yeah, they're also like, you know, we're in the, uh, like all the country here have reducing populations uh, problem and students are getting less and less. <laughs> and then we, we have to, you know, like, try our best to encourage students to come to show up. And yeah, this is reason one. And the second reason is uh, uh, in our career stage, we have uh, early stage, middle stage, or you know, a different senior stage. So in the early stage, we're all you know, trying to, you know, to pass the tenure and also 
uh, so so busy with all the errands and etc. So we have priorities, different priorities, and so I also did more uh, uh, open science after I more or less feel secured, and also the the, the feeling that um, people are uh, yeah just feel that they they have to do these things first and before they can do do that and. This kind of mindset is uh, still present, and I also agree with <clears throat> many of the uh, panelists or uh, student. Uh, uh, fee uh, sorry, the, the audience feedback. Um, uh, the I, I remember two sentences from <clears throat> myself earlier. Uh, one is uh, the advantage of being a teacher or faculty is that you don't feel shy asking questions in the uh, in in Asia, in Asia countries. And the second thing is, we all feel that in Asian people, the more people, the less likely you're going to talk. And we all feel that, I, I, at least I share with many uh, Asian students. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Maybe almost a kind of same comments, but this kind of repetition, yes, I think they are very shy. So shy. I, I don't know how what teachers just going to do sometime, but in general, because maybe it's not just based to the Hakkason, because let, let's see some maybe dance party last night. Not so many Japanese students, not so many Korean students, not so many Chinese students in there. <laughs> That's my view. Maybe I'm very biased. But I think there's kind of similar culture of fear to getting into very new social situation. That's very cultural. It's very difficult to just change because I couldn't just enforce, this is the job you should, you must go to the dance party last night, you should do it. I, I cannot say it, so <laughs> I didn't do it. But one student goes there, he enjoyed it. But, <laughs> well, I think that maybe the point is, if people have a prior knowledge that there are some people they already know out there, I think this just mental barrier just goes down. I think it's just very important because I think because the Asian just students so shy, if they assume that I just don't know nobody, then I don't know what to do. I don't know how to speak with people. I think that level of fear just goes up. So maybe I think there may be a good mechanism to just already assign some maybe key students, key postdoc who can be potentially active. And those people can just announce it more. Then if they know those people are there, maybe it's just much easier to attend. So that's my guess. Well, I mean, um, there's always this initial, I, I wouldn't say initial resistance, it's more like initial hesitation, I think. Um, so once it's actually past the critical mass, I think they'll go. Uh, but then initially, it might need like a gentle push. I don't know. I mean, as an advisor, I always, uh, always I mean, debating that, uh, you know, should I say something? Like, I mean, I don't want to force them, but, you know, volunteerism sometimes, I mean, uh, you know, initially it may not work and maybe voluntold, I don't know. <laughs> So um, there's this like uh, the book that I really like uh, by Dr. Seuss, like Green Eggs and Ham, like try, try, try it. And then some people uh, who tried and if they spread the words and uh, I think that's going to change it, but gradually. Right. Yeah. Uh, Rampon, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I, I think maybe I just have two more cents. Uh, one is that um, the language barrier. So I think for many graduate students, then especially for East Asia students, they are not so confident about their language skill. So they, they're shy and they also, they, they are not so confident about their English skills. So they, when it comes to this kind of uh, international, uh, like work, workshop or hackathon, they are just, uh, uh, just too anxious to, 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 to participate. Uh, the next point maybe is that we are not so familiar with the form of a hackathon. Uh, at, at least for most uh, students with um, a non-engineering background, well, uh, from not uh, students not from computational science. So, for conference, uh, we used to sit in there and listen to uh, the speaker, right? Instead of actively engaging and and uh, like co-work on some project, I think this. This form itself is new to many of our students or, or graduate students. So as we, as, as I mentioned before, we're trying to get people familiar with this form and we starting to like have a yearly hackathon uh, in China and in person so that we like involve more students and ask at least that they first need uh, engage in some hackathon using language they are familiar with. Then maybe they still need, they know how it goes 
and then they might be next uh, less anxious. Yeah, that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we're short on time. So do we want to do one more question? Yeah, we could do one more question. And later, there's a table talk that we could discuss more at 1130. And please don't be shy. It's just a small circle here. Okay. Not many people. It's not a crowd. <laughs> you know, you know, I was going to talk about this Asians being shy thing <laughs> right now. Um, so, um, I mean, I personally just went start attending OHPM and going to a brain hack uh, by myself. Um, it might have been a bit easier for me because I am more fluent in English than most Koreans. But um, but I, 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 I think, first of all, people at brain hack are very nice people. <laughs> I can guarantee you that when I like first went to, uh, went to my first in-person uh, brain hack in Glasgow, um, I did not feel excluded in any manner. Um, even though I was basically by myself um, from my own institute in my my country, actually, um, I was instantly um, I felt I felt like I belonged. Um, so um, I think um, it's you can you can tell um, when when you're telling your students to you know try going to Brain High, you can tell them um, that at least one person can vouch that we are very nice people. <laughs> um, and also something else is that um, um, I think every I, I uh, what's it? Uh, 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 sorry, I, I forgot your name. <laughs> um, but um, you mentioned that uh, Asian students don't are shy and don't try to do things, uh, start doing things by themselves. But also uh, on the other hand, if the PI or you know like a superior or like uh, or their uh, um, you know their senior senpais. If they tell if they tell them to you know you know you should just go, <laughs> then they tend to just you know go even if uh, I mean maybe um, for, for maybe pressuring them to go is not the best way, but if they can um, um, pass that barrier, there's like no barrier at all if they you know just tell them to go. So I think it's. Um, uh, I think uh, it was really funny because Dr. Shim was like, "Should I tell my students to go or not?" But but I, I think I think you should just tell them to go. I think I think most people. I mean, may, maybe they will be uh, hesitant at first, but if they just try going to you know OHBM um, event, brain hacking, and other events first, I don't think they'll regret it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to thank the panelists today and the comments. Let's give it a round of applause. Uh, thank you for all the comments. Yes. And I would also like to slid in an advertisement. So if your student are hesitate, maybe they could try volunteer first. And we already open a recruitment form and they could sign up and maybe it's easier for them to join as a volunteer. They belong to us right away. So that's there. <laughs> Thanks everyone. So we have the table talk later at 1130 if you want to continue with this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.